I call this meeting of the Student Senate to order. I believe our roll call is correct. So thank you all for coming in and checking in with Clerk Bridge. Uh, we can move now into public forum and presentations. So uh, public, for, public forum provides a chance for individuals to have the privilege of speaking before the Senate. This is a time for the association to listen to what the community has to say, and to that we offer our undivided respect and attention. I would like to remind everyone that although we allow the speakers the privilege to use this platform, the opinions of the speakers do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the association or the university. I believe we have someone here to speak in public forum tonight. If you wanna come on up. Talking face, better? Yeah. We good? Uh, hi there, my name is Scott Jensen and I serve as the Associate Dean of Students here on campus and in that role, I work with both student conduct and with housing and residence life. And what I wanna do today was um, talk about the housing rates for next year, so 22, 23. And a lot of you probably aren't thinking about next year, but this is a time we spend a lot of time in housing and residence life talking about and thinking about um, next year's rates and w the way we're gonna prepare for our students coming in. And so as part of that and working with our Kansas Board of Regents, um, one of the things we do annually is share with folks um, what our plans are in terms of rates um, for the upcoming year and getting feedback from, from you all as our um, student body. So um, for normally I'd bring a handout so I could share with you all exactly what the increases or changes would look like, but um, for the third consecutive year, we're excited to let you all know um, that we do not plan to raise our rates, so they will stay current. Thank you. Um, they will stay current what they are right now, and that includes both our housing rates and our dining rates. And um, just to put that in a little bit of perspective, um, each year, and, and they need to, right? Chartwells is our dining provider. They do raise um, their rates of what they charge us. And if you all have followed the news, you've heard about the supply chain and, and the, the cost of goods to them and their ability to get goods is going up considerably. Um, and so they've raised their rates with us each of the last um, four years, but we have, within housing and residence lives, absorbed those costs so that we're not passing that on to students because we know um, all of WSU is dedicated to keeping our rates as low as possible and making WSU as affordable as possible to students. So um, I think that's good news. We're excited about it. We're excited to be able to, to share that, but I will open up any questions anyone has about anything related to housing at all. Are there any questions? Senator Glenn. So you said there's no plan to raise the rates. Is there a specific date that you would know for sure the rates are not going up? Uh, yeah, I, at this point we will not um, put forth a request to raise it from the Kansas Board of Regents and those um, meetings take place in November and so without us asking, I don't, I would guess they wouldn't come back and tell us, no, you have to raise your rates, but stranger things have happened. But I know they're dedicated to the same thing we are as keeping costs as low as possible for all of you. Are there any other questions? Senator Bastian. Um, you'd mentioned that Chartwells as the providers absorbing a lot of, um, has raised their prices and uh, we're working to not pass that on to students, but my concern is um, would it affect the choice of food that the students have in terms of like healthy meals, which might get more expensive? Gosh, I didn't know it turned off. When they talk, it turns off. I'm very good with technology. I will become our new IT person in housing. That's how we're saving money, <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, so um, how Chartwells continues to maintain their, their level of quality and their standards that they, they set forth, which are high, um, that's how they do it, is by being able to increase um, to cover some of their costs. So, so they are, they're raising their rates um, annually, just like most restaurants do and other things. 
it's, it's called a cost of goods, um, that they just kind of follow what the national average is. And so, um, so it's again, it's very normal. It's part of our contract with them that they can increase it each year. I guess the only reason I raise that is we are working not to pass that along to students that those chart wells can continue to maintain the quality that they do have um, without us raising the cost to you all as students. Does that make sense? Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you all very much and thank you all for the work you do for on behalf of students. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in public forum? Okay, seeing none. We can move into the next item, approval of the minutes. Uh, you should have all received the minutes um, in our legislative packet. So does anyone have any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes will be approved if there are no objections. Okay, moving on to the next item, introductions and reports. Item A, report from the executive branch, Vice President Gums. Good evening, everyone. I hope you guys had a great day today. So from our cabinet report today, as always, we are continuing doing our administrative work. Um, just day-to-day -day basis, make sure that the student government is running as it's supposed to, and of course, working on different projects that we are, you know, dealing with. Um, one project I do want to highlight on, which is named the Big Banner Project. And the Big Banner Project is gonna be focusing a lot on reintegration efforts with the university and helping sharing information um, to students as you walk through campus. And of course, that will be done via banners and with the new wonderful technology that we love at this university, QR codes and everything in between to make sure that students have the information that they need. So for example, the beginning of the semester, you will have all that information in regards to how to work Blackboard, how to do this, in regards of your academic wellness. There'll be a period of time that will focus on wellness, so how to access care team, um, uh, um, information about CAPS, student health, et cetera. So that's a project that we are working on carefully with student affairs at this moment. Um, the treasurer himself has continued to work on the budget for student fees and, of course, working on information with the budget and finance share on, you know, letting people understand and learn a little bit more about the student fees process and how everything is going along that. We're also working on our five-year plan for the Shaka Support Locker. If persons don't know about that, we have a Shaka Support Locker in Grace Wilkie, and that locker has contribute uh, food, <laughs> clothing, and books um, to students who are in need and need to access those services. And of course, it's been five years since it's been first initiated here on campus and we want to make sure that that next five years is very successful, especially with the transitioning with um, Clinton Hall now becoming a student success center and the Shocker Support Blocker eventually moving over there. So we have that five year plan and of course, more public knowledge will come up about it soon. Um, we're also working on putting together Food Insecurity Task Force. And so if you have any interest in food insecurity here at Wichita State in the Fairmount neighborhood and Wichita in general, we ask that you send an email to our director, Hannah Harpel at sga.outreach at wichita.edu. So that is at sga.outreach at wichita.edu. And lastly, we are having our flu clinic next week Tuesday the 26th and Wednesday the 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at RSC 142. Um, this is on the flu clinic. Once again, we're partnership with Student Health Services and Student Affairs. I encourage everyone to make sure they get their flu shot as we, it's getting colder outside and you know, flu season is on the way. And as we still you know, navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, we want to ensure that everyone is healthy and happy. So once again, the flu clinic is next week Tuesday and Wednesday, the 26th and the 27th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at RSC 142. It is first come, first serve basis, and we ask that you participate, and more information about that is on all our social media platforms. And that's my report for tonight. Are there any questions? Senator Bastian. 
Um, what is the purpose of the Food Insecurity Task Force? What are you trying to, what's the aim? Um, so if, for those who are not fully aware, um, Wichita State is technically um, located within a food desert. So that means we do not have any supermarket or any resources where you can get fresh food within about a 10 mile radius. You have to, if you're looking about it, it's a decent drive from here down to Rock Road to access the Dillons and the Walmart, et cetera. And that's a problem for students, especially a lot of freshmen who live on campus who don't have access to transportation. So it's really hard to get fresh food if you live on campus and within the, firm, within the neighborhood and this area of town in general, we are situated in a food desert. And in order to be good students and in order to be thriving students, you need to be able to eat and eat good and eat healthy and eat whatever you want to consume. So food insecurity does impact how we function as students. We know there's countless times where at the end of the night, we're just hungry because one, dining hall is closed. The options we have on campus is not really nutritious or we can't really eat it. And so situations around those tasks. So that task force is really just to look into all that issues and how we can combat food insecurity on campus and within our neighborhood as well and our community. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, Senator Bastian. Um, actually, it seems to me that it's more of a transportation issue that we don't have transportation in the nights where students can actually go and access these locations rather than um, focusing on the food aspect of it. Is I there mean, a question oh, in there? Oh, yeah, a question. Sorry. Do you have a question? Yeah, so why not look into transportation instead of food insecurity because that would be something we could use like the cross-campus coalition and talk to um, the Wichita government itself to implement? Uh, so, of course, at the end of the day, it does boil down to different issues. But when you look at food insecurity, those different issues will also part in. So, like, how can we give trans more transportation for students to go to X, Y, Z? But then at a certain time as well, you want to make sure things are also walking distance, just in case someone is not comfortable for, per se, taking a bus to go all the way down to Rock Road at a certain point at night as well. So it's really, this task force is really just to have those conversations, bring up com questions that you yourself have and say, how can we address these questions? How can we address these answers? And then find that solution and present it as this body here at student government to make sure we can like ensure to fix it. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, we can move into the next item on the agenda, item B, committee reports. We can start with Chairperson Kirk. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's been having a stressless um, day so far, stressless week. Um, a lot of what the Budget and Finances Committee has been doing has been the same old thing, just a different day. Uh, people coming in and requesting money for certain events and certain things that are coming up for them. Um, the other things that I have been doing is, it was previously stated in the executive report that I've been working closely with Treasurer James, getting um, student fees information out there, accessible to all students, so that they know where your student fees money goes, that if you don't like how much is going where, you can go to your caucus leaders, your senators within Senate, and express your concerns, express your needs, ex and ask questions. Um, we, we just got finished uh, making some videos so that can be uh, posted everywhere. Um, I've been having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, people just asking questions here and there about the student fees process. Um, so yeah, I've also been uh, having conversations, I know I say this every week, but it's been getting more and more um, intense. I've been having in conversations with people within the appropriations process, just trying to um, make them, have them understand where the money has gone and how they can access that money. Um, and I want to emphasize um, highly that we have the two budget is budgets that we have here for the um, for all students here on campus are accessible to all students. Um, that has been a confusion that I've gotten a few emails about. So if you are an individual or um, 
uh, organizational funding is through us. All you have to do is go through um, the Shocker, Shocker Sync and it'll go from there. So there are ways, if you have any more questions or you know your constituent has more questions, please refer them to me or Treasurer James. I am open for questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Senator Brantley. Good evening, everyone. So um, again, we have sent out our emails to, well, the DEI committee has sent out our emails to the prospective offices regarding the issues, and now we're waiting for responses. Uh, I'm setting up a meeting with Jade over safety and security to discuss tabling and graphics and such for students to know what self-defense items they can, they can carry. And that mostly, you know, go towards the demographic of students who after certain incidents happen on campus just feel unsafe in that sense. And you know, that does affect our female demographic a bit. So, you know, that's what we're trying to help and get them that security that they need on campus. So hopefully we'll be able to get a graphic out and do some tabling information so students can know what they can and can't carry for self-defense reasons. And then our committee has also planned for November 18th to be our next Let's Talk About It series, which is focusing on cultures and how certain people feel that their cultures are represented on campus so they'll be able to express themselves, express what grievances they have had on campus, what pushback they've had regarding their own culture on this campus. So that is some of the things that we have been working on so far. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Chairperson Morton. Hello, everybody. Um, hope you're having a stress-free week like John said. I know I am. Anyways, uh, so <laughs> uh, just going over primarily just what my uh, senators and my committee have been primarily doing. They've been doing a lot of independent work regarding the committee. Um, we're still kind of focusing more on the whole weapons thing, kind of getting uh, clarification, a double checking on what is legal, what is not legal on campus. And like, and like Chairperson Brantley said, we're kind of doing a little more collaborating. We're gonna be in the talks soon. Um, and then the safety walk last week went pretty well. There was pizza there, it was yummy. Uh, we were able to ride the go-karts around with the police. Um, they were very, very friendly, very thankful, and I'm very glad they were to help us. Um, we lot, saw a lot of different lights that were out primarily, uh, but we went over that with my group today, and yeah. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Chairperson Perkins. Hi, Senators. I hope everyone is having a good week. Um, so the ICC Cross Campus Coalition hosted their first event last Thursday with candidates for Wichita City Council. And overall, we've received some pretty positive feedback from that event, so that's awesome. Um, on Monday, the committee met with Vice Mayor Johnson to discuss issues impacting students in the broader community. One of the key issues we discussed um, was the work he's doing to establish a grocery store near campus, which I know um, Vice President Gums mentioned. Um, and he's actively working with three developers to have a grocery store developed on 17th Street. The implementation of this would take up to 18 months, so this is not something that's going to be happening rapidly, but there's number of other solutions if this is something you're interested in I'd be more than happy to talk to you more in depth um, and the other thing we discussed with him was issues actually impacting transportation related to food insecurity so I know that was discussed earlier um, with questions to Vice President Gums and I just wanted to state that we are setting up a meeting both with our um, director of auxiliary services here on campus that works with Wichita Transit and also the director of Wichita Transit Mike Tan um, to try to establish a route that would go directly from WSU to our local grocery store to address some of those transportation issues because I know especially for 
for international students and just students that live in dorms in general, transportation is a key issue. Um, so I think that will definitely be a productive conversation. And again, if you're interested in that, I'd be more than happy to talk more about it in depth. Um, and other than that, we will be tabling tomorrow to help students register to vote from 10 to 2 p.m. on the RC North patio. So we're excited to be doing that once again. There's one more shift open um, if you're interested in helping out and we will be giving out Krispy Kreme donuts again. So you should stop by if you're interested and double check that you're registered to vote and you can get a donut. So yeah, love to see you tomorrow. Um, other than that, I'm open to questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Chairperson Majors. Hello everyone. Um, I'm sure you can remember that I've referenced almost every time I've spoken to you, student organizations in one way or another, because that's one of the main things within our jurisdiction at least for now. Um, we hosted um, meetings for individual student organizations uh, today. We had three of them, all three of which were unanimously confirmed um, by our committee. Uh, I think they're great groups. Hopefully uh, we'll see similar results in the Senate uh, at large. Um, they, those groups were Cyber Shocks, uh, the Exotic Food Packaging uh, Appreciate, or Appreciation Society, I believe is the name. Uh, and then the Flute Association at WSU. Um, and if you'd like me to go into any depth on those, I, I guess I can. Um, also, we had a piece of legislation that came through our committee, uh, we, which we debated and voted on today. Um, personally, I've been doing a ton of research uh, regarding the student organization process, as well as elections. Um, personally, um, if there are any questions about either of those things, I'd be happy to answer as well. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Chairperson Thompson. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a good Bones Day, if you understand that reference. Um, so this week, um, I spoke with my advisor and Andy Beggs with student involvement about uh, the campus survey process at the university. Uh, and potential routes my committee and I could take with that. Uh, I have a resolution coming to the floor in new business tonight regarding the A-plus proposal that I'll talk about more later. And then I read through the procedures for tenure and promotion at the university and gauged how much student voices are considered in that process. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. All right, we can move into the next item, item C, the legislative report. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope we're all doing good. Um, let's start with uh, what we did last week. So uh, last Thursday, I attended the ICAA meeting as a representative for the Student Senate. Um, we went over some budgetary issues there and some audit stuff, uh, as well as attending a um, RSC Board of Directors meeting where we also went over some of those things. Um, also attended the ICT Cross Campus Coalition panel event, which was great. I had a great time. Uh, and then we went to the safety walk right after that, so it's kind of a long day, but it was a good time. I think we did some constructive stuff on the safety walk, so I'm excited to see how we kind of progress with that. Um, I've also been setting up meetings with new senators and just anyone who wants to knock on my door, which seems to be a lot of people lately. Um, uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it for me. So does anyone have any questions? All right. All right, we can move to the next item in the agenda, the consent agenda. Uh, there was a change, so the, I think it was 52, is that correct? Yeah. SB 64-052 was withdrawn, so that is no longer on the agenda, but uh, everything else you see up there should be correct. So um, if there are no objections, we will approve the consent agenda. All right. Hearing none, we can move into the next item, consideration of pending business. Uh, before we get into the item, I think uh, Advisor Fonseca wanted to advise, so. Hi. 
Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Oh, I'm going to try that again. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hello. Wonderful. Um, OK, so this is going to sound like I'm reading off of something, because I am, because I typed out my thoughts as I offer you the best possible advice that I can about how uh, to handle uh, the pending business that we're, we're looking at. Um, you know, as I, as I started thinking about um, how to formulate my, the words that I want to share uh, with you all uh, regarding the piece of legislation tonight, um, I started doing a little bit of, of historical research that student government has um, addressed and handled in the past uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I recognize tonight that you're being asked to make a decision that some of you um, are not necessarily comfortable with, um, and a, de a decision that truly, in fact, right, is, is a responsibility and a power that is designated to you by the, by the Constitution, specifically to directly to the legislative branch, meaning each of you. Um, tonight, you're also being asked to uphold a duty under your oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the student body a commitment that I hope each of you have taken seriously since day one in the Senate, regardless of when that was. As an official of the association, you're also charged with conducting business that is in harmony and pursuant to the duties as prescribed under SGA law. Tonight, you are charged with conducting a practice that has traditionally not been scrutinized under former practices and with, between your predecessors as well. While yes, your predecessors have once before taken different actions regarding something similar to tonight, my advice to you is that you follow the rules that are laid out for you by you. It was not that long ago in 2017 when the SGA Supreme Court under case 2017-005 uh, unanimously voted to overturn a decision of the Student Senate to recognize a student organization. Additionally, in Healy versus James in 1972, the US Supreme Court held that denying a rec recognition of an organization violated the student speech and association rights. The court held that the only potential bias on remand that the lower courts must find to justify the denial was a determination that the student seeking recognition, the organization seeking recognition, were determined not to abide by school policies. In several cases in the Eighth Circuit, the Fourth Circuit, all courts deem student governments as state actors, meaning you have a responsibility to act as such. I know that the impact of tonight's decision is going to have on some of you. I also recognize that members of the association, your peers, may not be thrilled about so the decision that will be made either. I know some of you are uncomfortable with making this decision. However, as your advisor, I've always tried to give you the honest truth and the honest advice. I am strongly under advising you to understand the ramifications of this decision. Additionally, I want to make it very clear that the Senate vote to grant recognition is not an endorsement of the organization, but instead a recognition that it has met the criteria of recognition laid out, to, laid out by you in the statute 001 of the student government. Earlier today, I also sent you information that was sent to uh, the office of the speaker um, from a, a third party organization that hopefully, if you saw your email and you read that letter, uh, laid out uh, different aspects of, of information about tonight's uh, decision as well. You know, I, I know that, and again, going back to what I said earlier, I, I recognize that there are going to be probably people on either side who are going to not necessarily be happy um, about whatever decision is made tonight. However, again, as I, I strongly say, I urge you to follow the rules that were listed out by this organization or by this association uh, under our, our governing documents as well. And I'm, don't, I'm, I'll answer any questions if you have any. Um, but I don't know how much I'll be able to answer that in public if you have specific questions. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Uh, now we will move into consideration of pending business. Item A, the clerk shall read. SB-64-050, the Ways and Means Committee introduced the following, an act concerning the approval of Turning Point USA. Thank you. So we will move into the debating period at this time. Do I see a debate in favor of this bill? Senator Short. Because Turning Point has fulfilled all the requirements to become a registered organization, I will be voting in their favor tonight. However, as was mentioned in previous meetings, it is of utmost importance that they follow the rules outlined for students and their organizations on our campus, as well as all state voter registration laws, however trivial they may seem. 
This being said, I encourage everyone in this organization, everyone in this room, and everyone listening to deeply consider the consequences of the type of blind nationalism that this organization is encouraging. The belief that any one country is strongly better than another is a toxic mindset. It is harmful not just to the world, but also to the soul. I love America. I am frequently proud to be an American, but it is important to recognize and celebrate the myriad cultures and identities that come from other great nations, especially those that are represented on our campus. It is unfortunate and undemocratic that we are placed in a position of a vote like this, one where one of our options would potentially be construed as unconstitutional and is construed as unconstitutional. But because they have done everything necessary to be a registered student organization, I am voting yes, but I am disheartened at our apparent inability to pick anything other than approval. Thank you, Senator Short. Do I hear anyone in opposition? Senator Majors. So I'll try to keep this brief. Um, <clears throat> regardless of uh, your opinion on the group, just simply their viewpoint, which we are barred from making decisions solely based upon, uh, th there's some important things that we need to consider in framing this, this debate. And um, this is extremely important and inherently a part of this discussion that has to be had. First and foremost, I don't believe that we should allow ourselves as a student government to be strong-armed or legally threatened by a group most commonly known, at least in my experience, for defending racism and the use of racial slurs in academic settings, especially when we are dealing with an issue in which racism could be a part of the problem. Secondly, I believe that the legal argumentation they forwarded to us, one, was missing huge degrees of context, and secondly, in bad faith. I will later get into the missing context, but first, let's discuss why I believe it is in bad faith. Firstly, they have funded events for Turning Point USA specifically and are close allies and work with them. Secondly, they broadly assumed that if we made a decision denying the group, the sole reasoning would be because we disagree with their views. This is already untrue because as noted by Senator Perkins in last week's discussion, she referenced an action that the group has already taken. Not to mention, no further debates recorded make any claim to disagree with the group's sole view, be or view being the sole reason for denial. Thirdly, they failed to mention in their legal analysis that emotional harm is also a legal standard because it was convenient for them to do so. It is important to address Healy versus James. And the fact that Healy versus James uh, was a single, the facts in Healy versus James is that it was one single president of a university that reversed a decision made by a body of students and faculty. So essentially, if we decide no to this group and the president would, were to overturn our decision, then we would be similar to Healy versus James. However, we are a democratically elected group of individuals. We are a student government that literally and representatively is the students. We are much different than Healy in this way. Who is better than the students to determine what would be better for their educational environment? I can assure you that it's not fire. We as universities are nurseries for democracy and the birthplace of ideas, but we aren't a platform for disgusting and hateful rhetoric and harassment. We don't have to permit groups on extremists on either sides of the political spectrum on our campus. It is obviously more undemocratic and restrictive to bar our association from democratically making a decision that we believe is in the best interests of students. Colleges do have the authority to regulate recognition of student groups, but the sole reason cannot be their broader national organization. This is further proven if you actually were to have read the case of Healy versus James. They illicitly say that colleges do have the right to promulgate rules and regulations and to deny certain student groups. I can give you the exact legal language in the case if you would like me to reference the majority opinion. It is important that we know these things because we are being pressured and strong-armed by an outside entity to try to not do something that would be counter to the interests of our students. Um, Lastly, our association policies guarantee us the right in every way, shape, or form to make this decision. There is no associational policy that re requires that we don't make a decision yes or no. In fact, every bit of language that is in regards to student organizations says that we do have this power completely, and that is explicit language. Lastly, I think our Student Bill of Rights is the most common thing that could be used against us as uh, something to, to, in which we couldn't make this decision. Uh, in Clause 2, it talks about the affiliation with an extramural organization does not itself disqualify a student organization from institutional recognition. Uh, this is true. If we have reasons aside from solely their uh, extramural organization outside of the university, uh, then we, they're still subject to denial. 
And Clause 5 says that no officially recognized campus organization shall be deprived of that recognition, recognition unless they violate one of the previous clauses. However, that is talking about already officially recognized campuses. That, it says that explicitly in the language, and if that's not proof enough, it says deprived, which implies a prior given right that is being stripped from them now, which is not something that's happening. So in our discussion, I think whether you're on the yes or no side, you shouldn't fear legal or PR reprisal. Uh, you, you, should, you should be concerned with whether you think that this group will improve student life on campuses. We are here not to represent the interests of the university uh, administration or university donors. We are here to represent the interests of university students. And, and if you truly believe that this is in the best interest of students, I'd urge you to vote that way. And if you do not believe that, I would urge you to vote against it. Thank you. And now can we hear some discussion in favor of the bill? Yes, Senator Dix. Uh, so, as, oh, there we go. so as I get into this, I would like to preface it with saying that I would like this to be somewhat of a positive affirmation speech. I understand that many students at this point in time feel pressured that they will be voting yes uh, not because they believe that they should be doing so, but because they feel legally pressured. At this point in time, I do intend to vote yes by my own free will because I have confidence in the character of the leaders of this association, student leaders of this association, and their ability to abide by the already laid out student constitution that we have discussed in length during the discussion period two weeks ago. Uh, a week ago, I did not understand why a legal precedent was necessary or why a third party legal group may perhaps be called in to speak or draw an opinion on this issue. However, given past and current events, I understand that now this is an important legal precedent. And so I appreciate this group for at the very least providing some sort of counsel so that the student government has a basis by which to make the vote. I appreciate the president and vice president of this organization for being extremely active student leaders on campus from within the Student Government Association, Student Ambassador Society, and numerous other places on campus. I do not believe that either one of them intends to bring truly hateful ideas to the campus, nor do I believe that they pose any threat to a student's right to self-expression. On this merit, I do intend to vote for the passage of this bill and the recogni uh, recognition of this organization. Thank you. Is there any discussion um, in negation to this bill? Point of inquiry. Yes. Uh, to uh, advisor Fonseca, uh, in reply to that letter which you sent us, did the WSC Council have any uh, comments on that? None that I can share in an open meeting. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're, we were on. Is there anyone wishing to speak in negation on this bill? Uh, it's Senator Bastian. Um, I don't agree with the organization's purpose of identifying, educating, training, and organizing students because. If you have to identify students to join a club, that is inherently discriminatory. Is there anyone wishing to speak in affirmation? Senator Glenn. So just in my own research this week and in weeks prior on the process of becoming a registered student or recognized student organization, um, it is my belief and understanding that Student organizations on campus do not have to be recognized. They can exist. And when they want to have charter, they contact the Office of Student Involvement. This organization has already contacted the Office of Student Involvement, gone through the process, been approved by them, forwarded on to Ways and Means, who also approved it and has sent it on to us. I believe, since there is no actual breaking of any policies, that we need to just go ahead and vote on this item. So I'm going to go ahead and motion to end discussion and debate on this. Is there a second? Senator Dix, is that a second? I okay. second. 
It has been moved and seconded to end debate. Um, so that is not debatable, so we will all vote on that in one second. In the meantime, please make sure your eye clickers are on. Speaker Tubek, are we voting on the motion to end the debate or on the Yes, bill? to be clear, this is a, a voting on a motion to end debate, not on the actual bill itself. So. You need to make sure you hit AA first and then cast your vote when I open it. All right, we are ready to vote. To be clear, we are voting on whether or not to close debate and move into the voting period on this item. So A is yes, B is no, and C is abstain. With 19 in favor, 18 against, and two abstention, the motion fails for not securing a two-thirds vote. All right, thank you. And with that, we can, I think we were in affirmation, is that correct? So is there anyone wishing to speak in negation? Uh, Senator Fox. Uh, <clears throat> for the pure fact that I've spoke to multiple constituents over the past couple of weeks, and they're nervous that this organization would inhibit their own rights to their own political opinions and free speech, I highly encourage everyone here to uh, vote in negation of granting this organization. Um, yeah, it, uh, yeah. Thank you, is there anyone wishing to speak in affirmation? Senator, or sorry, uh, President Gums, Vice President Gums. Good evening, everyone, and I hope you guys, once again, are having a good evening. So I know it's kind of rare for me to have, you know, implement thoughts and ideas on this conversation. But after, you know, sitting down and observing our Senate and how everything is going on, I believe that I should represent myself and the voice of myself and um, President Khan. So I just want us to remember, you know, as we sit among ourselves as officials of the Student Government Association, I want us to remember our tagline. Our tagline is student comes first. Students come first. We took the oath to serve all, and when I mean all, I mean all students in this institution, all 16,000 of them. And unfortunately, sometimes this includes students who we might not agree with, and that's just the nature of life. We have to remember that as a student government, we are at a public institution. And we have to follow and understand the governing rules of this country, and especially the U.S. Constitution. This not might be everyone's favorite rules, but we do attend a public institution. It's everywhere we go. We get state funding, we get federal funding. And I just want to have us to remember that as members of this body, we are not just doing the work of shockers now, but we're also doing the work of shockers later. And I want that to like simmer down and think about it. Think about the future every time you make a decision on this floor. Because as Richard and I vote on, I mean, ran on, we ran on a legacy of change. Every single thing that is done here will have a lasting impact on how this university will function from years and years to come. So at the end of the day, I just want us to know that all the procedures that were outlined by our governing documents were followed correctly and I believe that you guys should actually vote yes on approving Turning Point UNSC. Um, so as someone that identifies as queer, I am obviously also a black woman, and I'm also an international student from the Caribbean, I do not fully endorse the messages of this organization, of course. But it is our responsibility as a student senate to give them the right to be recognized on our campus regardless. And you have to remember you're also the legislative body here. You have the right to look at these rules and regulations. If you realize, hey, this shouldn't be a process that we should be implemented, we shouldn't be stuck with these issues. These are conversations you as leaders on this, on, 
at this campus should help with each other, help with the speaker, help with your, with your leadership. These are situations like these open your eyes to the different issues that you, you probably didn't think was an actual issue until now. So I believe at this moment that you guys should vote yes. And then moving forward, we should have different conversations on how we need to ensure that we don't political size different student organizations that are coming on campus and how we can ensure this place is open and safe for all students at all time. Thank you very much. I'm now looking for a speech in negation. Senator Perkins. Yeah, this is honestly less of a speech of negation, but I, I will just say first off that I don't appreciate the pressure that's being put on senators to vote a certain way. I believe we're all elected or appointed as senators to represent our constituents, and it is our responsibility to vote to represent our constituents. And yes, we are obligated to represent all of our constituents, but at the end of the day, we have to represent the majority of our constituents. Um, and everyone gets to come to their own conclusion on what that vote is. Um, but I don't appreciate that senators are being pressured to vote either way. Um, I think you should vote to represent the constituents you were elected to represent, um, and you should continue to represent them, or you are failing your duties as a senator. Um, the other thing I would just say, and this is a point of information, um, just to clarify for the senators, to be clear, yes, the association can be held legally liable. Um, individual senators cannot be held legally liable. So you are allowed to vote as you please, and that is my understanding based on the conversations that have been had. You are allowed to vote yes, no, abstain, as you please, and as you see fit is the best representation of your constituents, but you are not obligated to vote any way as a defense of the association, you are solely representing yourself as a senator when you're taking this vote tonight. And Sen Advisor Fonseca is more than welcome to clarify if that is not the legal precedent, but I believe based on our conversation that that is the case. And I'll be looking for a debate in negation, or no, affirmation, sorry. I have a point of information. I'm, yes. I'm, I have a question from debate from the previous meeting about where there was question about their um, following of policies w regarding events and the free speech that was happening or if there was like that considered free speech versus a event under the organization so i didn't know if there was more like details about that 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 could be shared so that we can understand if there is policy um errors happening that they're overstepping in any way that that would be a concern for us i just feel like that was a little unclear I think that's an SI question. Um, so I'm, I'm actually just gonna answer this from an SGA advisor perspective. Um, the Senate doesn't have the power to determine if a policy has been violated without it going through its entire process. So you, my strongest advice is you cannot use um, uh, an alleged policy violation as a reason um, because it, it was not a founded violation if whatever whatever the the motion that whatever the debate that came up last week regarding was um so i think that's just one thing to keep in mind that um if there was a, a perception of a policy violation um there was nothing that was reported and or nor adjudicated so that couldn't be any basis or grounds for um for not recognizing the organization thank you uh, i believe we are on affirmation all right does anyone have, okay, uh, Senator Imborski. Hello, oh, I didn't blow up this time, good. Um, I'll keep it very, very short. Um, this is a sucky vote. This is a really sucky vote. And at the end of the day, I'm voting in favor purely because as Ella said, Ella Perkins, that is, um, we're representing our constituency, and I believe my constituency has a high level of integrity, and I think that they're going to do what is right at the end of the day. So I'm going forward with it. Is there anyone wishing to speak in negation? Senator Majors. I know I spoke for a while last time. I'll keep this a little bit more brief. Um, first of all, again, there's like, possible legal constraints. Uh, I'll tell you that we're not a court of law, but both on the doctrine of prior restraint and ex parte young, we can make determinations based on what we assume that this organization will do based on their actions, that they don't have to violate a university policy, but if they've taken an action per se, even if we're not mentioning it as a university policy violation, we can still reference that in our assumption that they would violate uh, any, you know, 
certain code of conduct based on their actions uh, on the university prior. And I'd, I'd also like you all to know that, one, there's no legal consequence in my view, obviously. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I'm also not an organization that has a specific conflict of interest in favoring uh, the approval of this organization. Uh, so I'll tell you neutrally that I don't believe that there is a legal concern, and if there was, I don't know why the litany, the whole host of universities that have denied this group previously have not faced that same, same legal ramifications. Uh, I also would note that they have uh, denied them for a wide array of issues, uh, expanding from you know clerical issues to as far as blatantly saying that they are a racist group and they don't want to welcome that under their campus. I haven't seen that Supreme Court case, probably because it's not a real legal issue. Um, and I'll also say that secondly, uh, I've read back and forth every association bylaw statute uh, clause within the Bill of Rights and constitutional amendment. I can tell you that the specific statute in reference to student organizations in which we continue to mention that they have met all requirements, those are clerical requirements that they are required to meet. Mind you, the portion that discusses in the, the, the Senate's discussion of a student organization never references that we have to use a certain set of standards uh, or, or guided principles in, in making our decision. In fact, it leaves it so ambiguous as to say as the Senate simply can make a majority decision on whether to approve or deny a student organization. So there's no ramification within the rules and regulations insofar as I have read them. And secondly, I don't think there are legal ramifications if you all are you know, on the edge and, and that's the issue that you're wondering about. Thank you. Is there a speech in affirmation? Yes. Was the was their uh, proposed constitution made available by chance? Like an electronic version possibly that we would be able to reference? Uh, I need to pull it, so give me just a second. Sorry to make your job harder, Gabe. It is in your inbox, in your email. Is there a question specifically you're looking for on it? I can just um, look. My question would be if the, if the RSO is to be approved, this is the constitution that we would be able to hold them accountable to when, in regards to like maintaining their status as a RSO. Um, so yes, you're able to maintain them to their constitution that they submitted um, for a record. Uh, the bylaw is the constitution of the student government, so there's a, a slew of them plus university policies and the RSO handbook. Since that was a point of information, I believe, is there a speech in affirmation? Senator Barry. So I'm voting in affirmation because I believe that this group has done everything they need to do to become a recognized group. Uh, but in my humble opinion, I believe that uh, as senators, we should not abstain in this unless you have a direct conflict of interest. Uh, it is our uh, position as senators to be voting on these issues. And I think that we're doing our constituents a disservice if we don't go through with that and vote yes or no. Thank you, Senator Barry. Is there anyone wishing to speak in negation? I have a Senator point Balaji. Of oh, sorry, did I hear? Yeah, um, Gabe, we cannot open that link. Okay, hold on, I'll do it again. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 
as advisor Fonseca is forwarding us the uh, PDF file. Uh, so I mean, I, I was thinking about it a lot, and it, and I mean, for me, it's logically the answer is simple. One, uh, there seems to be like a lot of talk about legal ramifications and everything, for which we are not equipped to uh, completely understand uh, or even uh, completely look into like what what exactly is the ramification and whether our decisions will be turned. We are operating under a, a premise that it might be turned. So right now we are at crossroads. Either we listen to our constituents and vote no because they don't want it. If your constituents don't want it, then just vote no on it and let the lawyers talk it out. It's, I mean, to, to work, the most dangerous thing in this world is, is a half-baked knowledge. And especially if you don't understand anything about the legal ramifications, don't come under the pressure uh, uh, just because somebody's asking you to and somebody's uh, extrapolating that we are going to face a legal ramification. So the choice here is simple. Either listen to your constituents or bow under the pressure. I'm voting no. Did you get the, okay, the new link should be sent. Does anyone know if you can access that? It opens, okay. I have a point of um, information. Yeah. So if Turning Point is not granted RSO status, are they going to be um, held accountable by any kind of administration, like the administration of Wichita State, or are there any like regulations they have to abide by, or can they just kind of exist on campus and table without any restrictions? I'm thinking, hold on. So I'm going to give you an answer. And then thankfully, the Dean of Students is also here. So I might yield my time to him to see if he can maybe clarify if I messed anything up in the response. Um, so for the university to, or for a student organization, a group, group of students who wants to be recognized by the university, they're, so you can't just exist as an organization on campus. So I guess let me just say that, right? So there are, there is a, the student and then there is the, the student organization. And so the, the power to recognize student organizations um, is within the student government. Um, so that, that's that piece, right? So um, if, an organization or a group of students violate university policy, um, and right, specifically university policy, um, and that is reported, then the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards uh, would be the entity in which would address um, student violations to the student code of conduct. Um, so Dr. Austin is nodding his head, so that would be the correct answer to that, your question. Do uh, we have a speech in affirmation and in negation? Senator Cadillo. I will be mm, voting against this organization because I don't believe that their mission statement will provide um, underserved students a safe place on campus for them to be engaged with. So I, I just simply believe that this organization was in response to a lot of social issues that have been coming about within the past few years, and especially since COVID. So they're a conservative response to that, a limited government response to somewhere, something along those lines just goes against what I believe an underserved senator should vote for, because I think it was within my interest to um, amplify student organizations that are not going to be limiting the amount of resources or et cetera that may be provided to other students. And I don't, I mean, with the other discussions as well, I just think as, I mean, I don't think that we should be afraid of legal repercussions. I think that you should as well still just vote within the interests of your constituents. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak in affirmation? Sorry, one second.
we are going to recess for five minutes. Please be back here at 7.37.
Everyone, please find your seats. Please find your seats. We're going to be starting very soon. Everyone, please find your seats. I call the meeting back to order at 7.39 p.m. Thank you everyone for being patient. So I believe we ended on a point in negation. So I will be opening the floor to a point in affirmation. Senator, sorry, point in affirmation. Point in negation, Senator Owens. Hi all, I know this is kind of getting all muddled, but I'd like to first state that regardless of our personal opinions regarding the organization, the mere fact that some constituents have expressed concerns about their safety regarding this group is something to consider and I think has yet to be fully brought up. I've personally discussed with certain students about their feelings regarding this group and the possible promotion of unsafe action by its members. There have been some questions regarding the kind of blank spots within the organization on accountability of its members. For example, I think one of the large discussions in SGA these past few weeks have been accountability of their members. And I think this is something that is sorely lacked within this organization. For example, if a member were to perpetrate a, something that would be considered uh, hazing by their constitution or something against, you know, um, guidelines of the university, would their organization be liable? Would they, as, would their actions be protected by this organization by saying it wasn't committed during its, uh, organization of said, you know, uh, events or whatnot. I'm just worried about that. And I think everybody, all of us should be worried about the safety of our constituents. It is absolutely a priority that all students feel safe. And I do understand that promoting certain groups and having a voice is incredibly important. However, you cannot have a voice if you are unsafe, if you feel like you are being put in a position to not be able to fully voice your opinion, which I think all of us are being put in that position right now, currently. And I think as a senator, I am voting against this, primarily because of those blank spots within the organization of accountability of its members. But if they can ensure said accountability, then I have, and the safety of our constituents, then I have no qualms with allowing this organization, although I don't agree with its mission statement. I think as senators, we can't pass or you know, vote against legislation just based on our personal views. 
So this is something to definitely consider, the safety of our constituents, how our constituents feel about this, because yes, we are voting for this bill, but it's just important to consider the lack of accountability set forth within this constitution. And you all have this constitution now, so if you'd like to fully read it, or if maybe there's a blank spot that I missed that someone else would like to bring up, but I just, I would just like you all to consider that. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak in affirmation? Senator Dix? Uh, in contrast to the speech that has just been given, I have discussed with multiple of my own constituents discussing that they are comfortable or are neutral on the passage of this bill in the presence of Turning Point on the Wichita State campus. At the same time, I've also discussed with students who are uncomfortable that there are any partisan organizations on campus believing that a shift in one direction or the other serves to underrepresent or overrepresent a certain political viewpoint on campus. At the same time, I do believe that, as I gave in my previous presentation, the character of the people who are assembling this organization as a student leader-led organization on campus will maintain their own policy, adhere to university policy, and will not discriminate as is outlaid in their constitution. Therefore, I will be voting in favor and I will simultaneously move to end debate on the subject. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, sorry, who was the second? Uh, Senator Warden, thank you. Uh, it has been moved and seconded to end debate on this item. Uh, that will be no discussion. We'll move into a vote in when we're ready. Point of personal privilege. Yeah. To address the chamber. It's not a debate. It's just something that we should acknowledge for the record because I think the record will be scrutinized. I don't know if that counts as personal, personal privilege. It's just to address the chamber. I mean... I'm, I'm just not sure that a, a point of personal privilege, you know, that's, that's a complaint about comfort hearing a general, you know, I, I just don't think that that is a point that can be used to address the chamber. That's, that's my only concern, so. Do you want me to confirm that? Is that true? That is correct. Okay. Do we have the vote ready? All right, please make sure your eye clickers are on. Uh, a is yes, B is no, and C is abstain. And to be clear, we are voting on whether or not, once again, to end debate and move into the voting period on this item, so. With 26 in favor, 11 against, and two abstention, the motion fails for, secure, for not failing to secure a two-thirds vote. All right, so debate is still open on this item. We heard a debate in affirmation recently, and so now we must, now I open the floor to a debate in negation. Senator Majors, uh, sorry, you've already spoken twice on this item. So, no, Senator Dix spoke, just finished speaking twice. He seconded an item before as well. He, is, oh, he has only spoken twice. I'm sorry, you're only allowed to speak twice on each item. So, with that, uh, is there anyone wishing to speak in negation on this item? And in affirmation? All right, hearing none, we can move into the voting period at this time. And it looks like we are ready, so please make sure your eye clickers are on. To be clear, we are now voting on the bill. We are voting on whether or not to approve uh, Turning Point USA. So A is yes, B is no, and C is abstain. missing two people, so if you all can just quickly try it again. Mm -hmm. 
With 14 in favor, 21 against, and four abstention, the motion fails. Please, decorum. Uh, we'll move into the next item on the Again, agenda. Again, point of personal privilege to address the chamber. There's, you can't use a point of privilege. I'll go ahead and uh, I will uh, challenge, challenge you, your decision. Okay, fine. You can challenge my decision to use a point of personal privilege, which in Robert's rule says, a complaint about hearing, comfort, etc. Is that what you want to do? Yes, I'm uncomfortable with the, re the record as, as it shows. You're, sorry, you're uncomfortable with the record? It needs, it, there's important notes to make, uh, it, judging that this record will likely be subject to scrutiny. All right, what is your issue with the record? Uh, I think it's important that we note that never was it a reason given solely that their viewpoint was our reason for voting against them. Uh, I think it's important that we note that there were three, or at least three, individual reasons given, none of which were Senator the sole Majors, viewpoint. It's not Senator, a debate. Senator Majors, you can make that point for yourself, but you don't know that that's the point for everyone else in this chamber. Blatantly, as it shows, at, given it's, the speeches. It's not shown that way. If someone in their speech wants to say that that's the reason that they're doing this, then they can say they that. Have. And if they decide not to, then that's on them. It's already happened. I just thought it was important to note on the record, since likely it's going to be said that our sole reason for voting against them was the difference in their viewpoint, that we had a litany of reasons, not just that. I understand that you want that to be stated in the Not record. just me. That, that was what was said. I point understand. Order. A point of personal privilege is not discussion. Thank you, Senator Thompson. We will now move in to the next item on the agenda, consideration of new business. Item A, the clerk shall read. SR-64-014, Engineering Senator Jay Thompson introduced the following, a resolution concerning the Faculty Senate consideration of the A-plus proposal. Hi everyone again. So I did some research uh, to give some background and in a way give a small history lesson. Um, in 2008, the Faculty Senate approved the transition to a plus minus system by a vote of 59 to 58. Several years later in the 58th session of SGA, students came to then student body president Joseph Shepard with concerns about the use of that grading scale. Due to these raised concerns, Joseph Shepard and then Senator Glasscock formed the Academic Affairs Committee. The committee developed and passed unanimously in the Senate a resolution to the Faculty Senate recommending the removal of the plus minus scale. Ultimately, the recommendation never gained grounding among faculty. Since then, much work has gone into researching alternate solutions. Last session, Senator Liu, Senator Sandy, and Senator Mosqueda authored a proposal suggesting to add an A-plus to the grading scale as opposed to removing the system entirely. Originally, three proposals, the faculty will have two proposals to choose from. One adds a 4.33 GPA A-plus to the scale, and the other adds an honorary A-plus, which would be shown on transcripts only, but not in GPA. This proposal has gained grounding among faculty. It is being introduced to the full faculty senate next Monday, and a full vote on November 8th. If a proposal is passed, it moves to a full faculty vote. Unsurprisingly, this is going to continue to be an uphill battle. So, I present to you all a res resolution recommending the addition of the A-plus to our grading scale. Joseph Shepard was a firm believer in the need for students to be involved in the academic discussion, and I second that belief. I hope, given the context, the 64th Senate can follow the 58th Senate's lead in acting on that discussion. Thank you, and I'll answer any questions. Are there any questions for the author? Senator Dix. 
Um, overall, could you present to us what you think some of the benefits are of uh, returning or adding on an A-plus system in uh, any of these proposals, and are there any educational uh, precedent that you are using to help kind of influence this? Um, so overall, the wording gets kind of kind of messy because people get confused with the terminology, but adding an A-plus to the system, uh, specifically with the first of the three proposals, technically two, um, would add a 4.33 GPA to class credits. So if you get uh, what a professor would deem an A-plus in a class, that class credits would, class, would count as 4.33 GPA credits, which would, like a 4.0 would, as an A does, raise your GPA. So there's no negative impact on any students with any, either of these proposals. Um, so, and could you repeat your second question? Uh, specifically, it was, is there uh, a non-Wichita academic precedent, or is this trying to return to something we've already been using? Okay, so it's not something that we have ever done before, but when the Faculty Senate voted 59 to 58 to install the plus-minus system, there was also an amendment made by a faculty member to remove an A-plus from that system. Uh, and so this is basically reviewing that original proposal to add the plus minus system and correcting it for what students over the past decade have had qualms about, or whatever the word is. Are there any other questions? Senator Majors? Yeah, um, so you might have noted this, and it might say it in the legislation. I'm, I'm probably just missing it, but uh, did you note that if either of these proposals were to pass, if they would work retroactively for students who have received A pluses uh, when coming into action, like whenever it's passed or whatever, with the students who are seniors and have A pluses on their transcript, would, would that GPA be a 4.33 as well? Or So unfortunately, I, I don't have the good answer to that question. It does, it's not retroactive for every um, class that has already been taken, mostly because instructors um, deem what is an A plus, and since that those classes are all over, they can no longer deem what an A plus would be. Um, but in terms of when it would come into effect, uh, if the Faculty Senate passes one of the proposals in three weeks, um, it would move to the full faculty vote, which is currently scheduled for November 29th. Uh, but I'm currently unsure of if it would go into effect in the spring, summer, or next fall. Senator Wassinger. Will this at all change the requirements for Latin honors for graduation? I do not believe so. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Since this is a resolution, we can debate and vote on this item tonight. So I will be opening up the floor for debate. Is there anyone in affirmation of this resolution? Senator Majors. Uh, though I'm pretty salty that it doesn't apply retroactively, I think we can look forward to our future uh, students of Wichita State and provide them with something that's going to better their academic experience. And I believe that if you're subject to, you know, B minus, C minus, uh, respectively, I think you should be also subject to receiving an A plus. Uh, so I think it's just, if we're going to abide by the plus minus standard, we might as well go all the way rather than half. Is there anyone wishing to speak in negation on this item? Senator Glenn. So based on another resolution we had, I am just um, more apprehensive based on the language. So this says that Therefore, be it resolved that the Student Senate of the Wichita State University Student Government Association, on behalf of the members of the association and united with the association, hereby implore, blah, blah, blah. Um, this states that we are voting on behalf of all of the students. Since I have not been able to get any really constituent feedback on this, I feel uncomfortable voting on this at this time. So I would like to motion to table this for one week. It has been moved to table. Do I hear a second? Is that Senator Short with a second? Uh, it has been moved in, t uh, sorry. It has been moved and seconded to table this matter until next week. 
Uh, there's not a debatable item, so we will move into the voting period at this time. Not yet, because we're not ready. All right, please make sure your eye clicker is on. To be clear, this is we are voting whether or not to table this item until next week. A is yes, B is no, and C is abstain. Twenty-two in favor, fourteen against, and one abstention. The motion carries. All right. So this item is laid on the table until next week. We will now move into the next item and new business. Item B. The clerk shall read. SB-64-052, Chief of Staff Ella Irig et al. introduced the following, a resolution concerning updates to the association's bylaws. The author wish to speak. Hi friends, I'm back. It's like we just did this, except it's gonna be longer this time. Um, so you should have gotten a little taste of what um, editing our journal looks like from when I was here with the constitutional updates. Um, uh, just a little note for you before we get into these because the bylaws only require a signature from the president, um, they will go into effect as soon as the president signs it, which is usually first thing she gets in the office tomorrow. So just a little note for you, these are gonna be a little bit more relevant um, and they are also a lot bigger. Um, if you didn't notice that the packet was 65 pages long this time. Um, also to note, uh, the clerk and I made a few last minute changes. I noticed a few numbers that weren't quite right matching, but I will let you know um, if there's gonna be anything that deviates from the version of the bill that you have. But the one up there will be accurate. Don't know if anyone's scrolling that one, but that one's right. <laughs> Okay, um, starting off, you will see that a lot of this bill is removed the following section. That removes everything in it. Um, and for the most part, I will tell you these removals are either because something is out of date and we don't do it anymore, something is just flatly not right, um, or something is so common and understood as precedent that we don't need rules to tell us to do it because that's just how things work. Um, so you see that up here with some first removals from the legislative branch section um, because we already make you do that. Um, again, another removal for Act 2. Act 3 just clarifies a little bit um, that the speaker does appoint um, our lovely clerk, Annalisa, um, and clarifies what the correct voting total on that should be. Um, Four does clarify that any member of the university committee may request that the speaker do something, um, keeping in mind that a member is not synonymous with a student. A member is a student who pays student fees. So um, those are technically who we govern, though we do often say we govern the students, technically we govern the members. So any member, but that also does then add as well the university committee, so that's everybody else. Um, again, you see some removals, um, just cleaning up some wording that doesn't need to be there. Here in Act 6, what you see will then be repeated, that same language that's crossed out is going to be repeated in 7.1, just underneath of it. Um, and then Act 7, just that one word additionally added in there, just a little grammatical change. Um, moving on to Act 8, the Ways and Means Committee does not have power over the Senate Review Board because that is a separate body, um, and the Chair of Ways and Means sits on that body, so he can't also be in charge of it. <laughs> um, here you see some clarifications to the specific purviews of the different standing committees. Um, there was some interesting parliamentary movement um, with line 110 through 112 skipping over to Act 13. Um, I will go ahead and just re-clarify going briefly back to 12. Um, that, that is removed because the support locker has its own independent functioning, so we don't need an SGA committee to do it. It functions all on its own. It does need us um, in that way. We are still important with them. Um, I am actually gonna come back because I'm guessing people have some questions about why part of this bill is red. Um, so I'm gonna come back to 10 through 12 because I'm guessing people have specific questions. So we're gonna put a pin in that one. Um, everything else, just clarifying, you'll see that um, Ways and Means and Government, or DEI and Ways and Means had the most 
slashes just because they had much, much larger sections of purview than everyone else. So we cut out some of that extra language to give them a little more flexibility to do the work that they need to do. Um, down here, there's just a few adjustments to um, caucuses. Uh, you do see the addition of a caucus for honors and a caucus for graduate. And then um, in these next few acts, there is a change. Anyone who is a member of the association can join a caucus. Um, I do believe, and Gabriel, or advisor Fonseca can clarify, um, only senators can vote in the caucuses, but anyone can participate in the meetings at least to be present. Um, because the caucuses don't have any legislative power, um, members who go through the process to be like members, that, like, so I'm going to use uh, Camila for a second. If Camila is, a, is an LES student and not affiliated with student government, um, but she wants to join the LES caucus, um, if she goes through the process to become a member of the caucus, then they can hold the vote. But if Camila just shows up to a meeting because she wants to, then no. Um, but if they go through the process, which is laid out by every caucus to decide themselves, um, then yes, they can technically vote because they don't have legislative um, authority with the exception of uh, the appointment of the student fees committee member. It's only granted to the senators of that caucus. There you go, just a little clarification. Um, skipping down here, um, a little clarification as to the um, main active business in the Government Relations Committee, clearing that up a little bit. Um, it passes just like any other resolution that they write will. Um, we are removing that whole little section because they just pass regular um, bills like the rest of you. Um, and then here, um, I did hear some concern about 21 through, what is it, roughly 23. Um, in terms of the treasure, this is not removing the treasure of the association. Um, that is just clarifying it a little bit because we did remove his existence from the Constitution and we said at the time it was to move him here with all of the rest of the cabinet. So that is where he is. He's not getting any new abilities nor is he losing any. Um, and then um, some removal of some extra wording there. Um, we do have to follow all the same rules in the cabinet as everybody else. Um, so that is there. Uh, Act 23, you do see the removal of the maintenance of a current roster um, and operational knowledge of the Constitution, bylaws, and statutes. Obviously, the vice president has to know how those things work in general because they're here, but technically, keeping a roster of all of your lovely names and faces is my job. I'm um, skipping on ahead a little bit more. Um, you see, yet again, a little removal. Um, it says in our rules that if something is not clearly dictated, we have to follow Robert's rules of order. Um, and Robert's rules of order will tell you that a quorum has to be at least 50%. So we don't need a bylaw that says it because that's just general practice. Um, then we see here judicial officers removing that um, because the judicial officers are all of them. They're all appointed. Uh, they all have important jobs, so they're all there. We don't need to clarify that the members of the committee are the members of the committee. Moving on to 28, um, this is going to be your first big, ch well, this is going to be what's really notable for you as a big change. Um, this was originally written as a removal that is incorrect. Um, it should be an addition, so it will be adding this language. It will not be removing it. Um, it is essential because it is section one, initiating a case in the Supreme Court, so you probably want some guidance to know how you start a case in the Supreme Court before you move on to step two. Um, moving on, uh, we did have a error with the numbering, so you will notice at this point we are no longer following the numbering that your bill has. Um, you will need to subtract two if you would like your act number to match up with what this finalized version of the bill says. Um, well, maybe not. I don't know which version of the PDF it is, but the final version that the clerk will have um, will subtract two from each of these numbers, basically from here on forward. Um, but other than that, it shouldn't really change anything. Just know you gotta do some quick math. Um, <laughs> again here, um, the Supreme Court will offer a ruling as applicable, not an opinion. Um, that's just some legal jargon. Um, and then again here, you see a little clarification. Um, 
the opinions of the court do remain in effect unless reissued by the court. Um, we do not lose all of our Supreme Court precedent every time we start a new session. It does retain until the court decides it is no longer good law. Um, and then just a little clarification down here in terms of cases regarding laws of the association. Um, they may not inherently be an appeal, so case is just a little bit more appropriate of terminology. Um, and we don't need to know that they have to follow the rules because they just generally have to follow the rules. That's how things work. Moving on a little bit. Um, this clarifies that in the hard association hardship permanent, the association hardship fund permanent select committee, um, that the student advocate will serve as um, one of the members of that committee. The um, assistant or graduate student of the support locker will not. Um, just because that's how it works. Um, and then moving on to 33, you see yet another small change. The director of public relations um, or designee will serve on the association banquet committee. Um, and then the speaker of the Senate is listed just because um, that is the more proper order of those two things. A little semantical change, but they sneak in every once in a while. Um, now we start to see a lot of removals um, starting with Old Act 32, prop, Old Act 34, Proper Act 32. Um, this is in relation to the association state of emergency. Um, I believe that this was enacted in response to the state of emergency that was issued for the COVID situation. Um, and that now that we are in still COVID times, but less extreme COVID times, I don't know a better way to word that. Um, we no longer need that specific clarification, but I will defer to advisor Fonseca if there's more background to that. Can you repeat that piece? That um, the association state of emergency, establishing it and explaining it was in response to COVID. And so that is why this gigantic chunk is being removed. Yes, and because the legislative council was made permanent last session, um, so there's no need for us to um, have the language for the state of the emergency since the Senate is able to dissolve itself into the legislative council when the Senate is not in session which happens every time we do a mid-year or end-year recess. Yep. Okay, so that is going to be um, old acts 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. <laughs> See how far I can keep going. 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 46, 45, 46. I can keep going at this for a while. 47 and 48. That was long. <laughs> Um, moving on again, um, now we're going to be in Article 8, which refers to the association's records. Um, this is an incredibly thorough section that doesn't need to be. Um, so we cut out a lot of this by adding um, 49 to say that the chief of staff, the clerk of the Senate, and the clerk of the court oversee these records, um, though I do have ultimate responsibility of fulfilling them. And then in Act 51, we just take what is several pages worth of writing and turn it into seven bullet points to clarify things. Um, so 50 through, I'm not counting again, that was way too much. Um, <laughs> about looks like 64 um, is just cleaning up all of that very painfully detailed explanation of how legislation is pre-written. Um, down to at one point, I believe it requires um, that Senate bills must be in numerical order because as if there was another way we were gonna organize that. <laughs> um, we're almost done guys, I know, so close, so long. Skipping all the way towards the very end, um, we see 66, uh, removing the following application language from the appointment of offic association officials um, because the application typically does contain those things, though um, it can contain more or less as deemed necessary by the uh, cause of the application. Whew, almost there. I hope you're okay. <laughs> Bless you then. <laughs> so moving on to the last couple, um, and this is gonna be another small little typo there. That should be 13, not Article 11. Um, this refers to, oh, sorry. My mother has excellent timing. Um, <laughs> the compensation of association officials. Um, there were some issues, questions, 
potential concerns raised um, in the way that we compensate association officials. Um, if you are an international student and you have very specific requirements of what kinds of money you can and cannot make while you are here. Um, so this was changed so that it was a little friendlier to um, those students, uh, though you will see no amount of money actually changes, just the way that we word that um, specifically. And then down here in our very last act, um, that just clarifies that math. So instead of being five lines, it is one simple sentence. Um, and that is the end of all 30 pages. So I will stand for, oh, you're right. I said I would put a pin in that. We're gonna go back to that. Flashing back to what is line 110. Thank you, Speaker Tubok. So we've had a lot of fun with parliamentary, parliamentary procedure in the last few weeks. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, so for committees, when we send a bill to the committee, um, obviously the committee can make amendments on a bill. However, it does clarify in Robert's Rules of Order that if you make an amendment to a bill that extends the scope of the bylaw change, um, and this is specific to bylaw changes, if you extend the scope beyond what the initial bill was meant to do, um, you then need to share that with the affected party to allow them to review it. Um, so there was in Act 13, um, line 10 through 12, um, this is going to be a little easier if you're looking at a colorful version of this bill and not my black and white printout of it. Um, the original wording of this stated that one of the um, obligations of the committee, one of its areas to review shall include um, performing assessments of issues facing students regarding diversity, inclusion, and equity. The Ways and Means Committee made an amendment that changed that wording to say um, being targeted by the university based on immutable characteristics. Because that specific line was not originally intended to be edited, it just had to be included because there were changes both above and below it. Um, that bill was then sent to the DEI committee itself to review whether or not they thought that was an appropriate change to their purview. Um, so I met with them two weeks ago um, and one week, two weeks, I don't know how long it was. Um, I met with them the appropriate number of weeks ago, <laughs> let's put it like that. Um, and I brought this bill again, gave a, a briefer authorship speech on it, um, and then they made an amendment to the amendment um, that reverted that wording back to the original wording, um, which is diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, because they felt that that was more appropriate for the work of their committee. And so it has come to you, including the old wording, but in red, because that was a change done by a committee, not me as an author of the bill. Um, and so should you pass it as it stands right now, um, it is if that language had been added and then immediately stricken, so it will just never appear in the bylaws, it was like it never existed. Um, or you could amend the amend of the amend and bring the wording back. Or you could do a third option. Um, so that's just a little information for you uh, as to how that parliamentary procedure works itself out. And now I will stand for questions. Senator Balaji. Well, it's more a question to uh, Advisor Fonseca. Uh, this is regarding the payment for international students. From I have been working with you since summer regarding this, and I was not updated that it's going to come to the floor because it's not, as the last email from the international office mentioned that it's still a quid pro quo. Has there been any uh, updates Before which I'm can, not aware of? You're saying it's in this bill? Yes, the, I mean, uh, the Chief of Staff just mentioned it. If you look at the last three acts of the bill, you will see that they are all changes to Section 13 um, regarding the compensation of association officials. It was my understanding that that was why that wording change was done, uh, but I may have been incorrect in my understanding. I would have to defer to Advisor Fonseca to clarify that. Yes, that is not done yet, so we need to take that off the bill. Oh, you were to hear, folks. <laughs> uh, are there any more questions? Seeing none. Oh, I got Thank a Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, this is the first read of this item, so we will go into debate and voting next week. So, uh, With that, we are moving into the next item on the agenda. Since there is no more business, 
We will stand adjourned until next week.